Welcome to um, the first of the MSL salons, uh, which are being run through Isolation Station. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this first one is called Ordinary Extraordinary, and each of the salons is being run by uh, an artist with visiting guests. And my name is Rosanna Lowe. I'm a story collector and a writer. Um, and last year I was commissioned to, um, I had quite an open commission to do anything <laughs> I wanted in terms of writing. And I was not very well at the time and I didn't have a lot of ideas. And I was worrying about that. And suddenly I thought to myself, well, Hastings is full of ordinary people with extraordinary stories or something extraordinary about them. So what I ended up doing is um, interviewing people, collecting their stories and turning them into sort of poems. Um, using their real words, but also slightly kind of poeticizing things. And um, we are obviously now living through extraordinary times and some people are um, doing extraordinary things as a result of that. So um, one of the things I'm wanting to do revisiting this project is to collect stories of um, extraordinary things that people are doing at the moment. And... Um, and so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure whether that got through that first bit of the recording. So I am going to share some poems that come from um, a project I was doing before called Ordinary Extraordinary. And this was initially inspired by a, a garden party with my neighbour. Um, and there was a woman at the party who had been hit by lightning when she was a child. And as a result, she said she'd become electrified. Um, permanently electrified and my neighbour who worked with her said oh yeah that's true I, I work with her and sometimes I touch the doorknob and get blasted off the other side <laughs> when she's touching the doorknob the other side so this sounded so much to me like a Gabriel Garcia Marquez short story that I turned that into a poem and so I will read that first poem for you now it's called The Lightning Lady so Lightning never strikes twice. Oh, it did. First time I was six, in a field barefoot, flung sky high, electrified, died for two minutes. Dad revived me, but the bolt made me feel more alive than ever. The world seemed suddenly jeweled in rainbow light. Once the lightning has stung you, sung you, blistered through you, it has claimed you, it will find you again. Second time, I was 17, drawn to the storm, thrown across the room, shocked again to be lightning's dumbstruck bride. At first I didn't know my own power, shocked colleagues as I shook their hands, gave lovers an electric kiss. The lick of the lightning still lingers. I still tingle when a storm draws near and anger gets me extra charged and makes my static hair stand up on end. I fizzle at my flesh-bound children. To hug, I hold a wooden spoon. Sometimes I don't let people near for fear that I might hurt them. At work, I wear a strap-on to tap upon the keyboard as I often blow a fuse, always need to ground myself so the heavenly power inside me is earthed. 
people say, you're amazing. No, I say, it just hurts. So that was the first of the poems that I wrote um, when interviewing people who were seemingly ordinary in Hastings, but were actually kind of slightly extraordinary. And um, the first guest that I have on is somebody that I interviewed for that project, uh, Alice Denny, who is herself a, a, a poet, a feminist and a trans poet. So it was pretty kind of nerve wracking sharing the poem with her that I'd written about her. But she's here today um, to share that poem with us. So if we can bring on Alice, that would be wonderful. Is Alice there? I'm mute. Hello, Alice. Hello. I've got a blob in front of my thing. Host has started, asked you to start your video. Okay. Is ah, that... what a vision. You couldn't <laughs> there we are. I'm back again. do this without seeing you, Alice. Yes. <laughs> Me and technology, eh? <laughs> yeah, me and technology as well. I'm not sure whether the <laughs> first it recorded. Okay. That was lovely. Oh, I've not heard that poem before. That was oh, fabulous. Thank you. thank you, Alice. Fabulous. It was like... <laughs> I want to meet that lady uh, from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Don't shake a hand. <laughs> so, Alice, would you like to share your poem with us? Um, then we'll talk a little bit afterwards. Okay, right. Well, this is um, the poem that uh, Rosanna wonderfully wrote um, about the interview that we had, which was really a tsunami of jumbled up stuff and how she made any kind of sense of it. I don't know, but she's come up with something pretty remarkable, I think. And um, I've put in a couple of extra words here and there, which make it sound like me, but apart from that. Um, okay. I was not, I guess, a conventional father or husband. Papoost, my baby used to come with me to lectures, or I'd carry her close in a Moses basket while I worked deck chairs along the beach. I'd grown up on a street of dirt, of dirt and gravel, opposite a huge mental hospital a magical playground of bounty, of vegetable patches and falling fruit where I could make my pies leap from trees with joy, tomboy joy, as I now see. Later, another huge psychiatric hospital where I worked as a nurse, offering kindness to so-called madness, nurturing human dignity, feeling my femininity and scrubbing with ether met until my skin turned paper thin. But secretly, I dreamed myself another Bridget Bardo life, laughing on Montmartre cobbles, arms overflowing with bunches of flowers and baguettes. I'd wake and look in the mirror and think, no, that's not me. Not he, I'm not that. On the other side of the looking glass, Alice was calling. For such a long while, I stopped smiling. Many years went by and the feelings grew and I knew I had to step through to the other side. It was do or die. I wanted to watch my transformation. To be awake for the operation, this ordeal to reveal the real me, this wondrous birth that would make the pain worth it. But they wouldn't let me. Now the plaster cast of my new sculpted self sits on my window shelf. I only hope the estate agent didn't notice. <laughs> Hastings Council My bank account belongs to someone else, Hastings Council insisted. They wouldn't let me vote as if I'd never existed. But as Alice, I felt more alive than ever. 
I wouldn't, I would always dream in black and white, but now I live in colour, feeling freed, dancing in red stilettos. Oops. Um, till my feet bleed. Sometimes a blue head, sometimes blue head in a fabulous flowered frock, or green fingered garden goddess, my plot chock a block with courgettes and runner beans. Alice, in my wonderland, trusting in womankind and the kindness of women. Still alone, still single, that's my bit. <laughs> when you come, when you're forced to wait and arrive so late to something like womanhood, every little bit of it tingles. Thank you for writing that. Thank you, Alice. With with some with some new additions from yourself today. Well, it's like, I'm sorry, I tripped myself up a little bit on it because I put some notes that I didn't mean to put in, and then they and then they missed it, but a little bit. No, it was lovely. It was I lovely. Apologise about that. No, no, I, no. It was lovely to hear it, and I think that you know what the writing of these poems is is quite delicate because it's it's a mixture, isn't it, of your words and my sort of take on it. So yeah. it was very nerve wracking sharing that poem with you the first time to see. No, it, was wonderful. it was wonderful. I put in the bit of still alone, still single, um, partly because of the rhyme, but mainly because I, you know you never know you might get lucky. <laughs> It's like a speed, a little bit of speed dating, like just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> online dating is what I meant. Okay, brilliant. So, Alice, if we can talk a little bit about your experience of, um, of the lockdown, because I know it's been very difficult, very different for different people and very difficult for some. Um, I have not myself found it very difficult because I was already more or less housebound. Yeah. So things didn't change, but I know that you have found it difficult and there were maybe certain things that got you through but do you want to talk a little bit about that uh yeah well um because i mean i'd been sort of housebound in my own way for quite a long while by um bus you know living in hastings and so on and um i was looking forward to a different kind of life of being yeah. my house just being a base to sort of go out from in the morning and come back to yeah. go out in the evening and to sit and work and write and stuff. And, um, and that didn't happen because two days after I arrived here, complete lockdown. Well, I think we should probably explain that you, you, have, you having lived in Hastings for many, many years, you've moved to Brighton, moved to Brighton to live. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I lived in Brighton. I moved I, backwards and forwards between Hastings and Brighton, really. But then I'd been in Hastings for four years and um, and wanted to get back to this sort of life. And I thought this year was going to be the year. Mm. This is going to be it. And then after this year, it wouldn't matter what happened. Um, as I think your second poem that you've written, you might, which you might do to touches on, well, more than touches on it. But um, so it's been really, really hard to redefine who I am at this particular time and what I'm doing and um, yeah, it's a funny time to have to to start again isn't it you you were just kind of starting a new beginning and suddenly that was a uh, stopped I think I maybe will read um the other poem that I wrote for you Alice and I had another interview yes. um a couple of days ago wasn't it and I very hurriedly yes. Alice is always full of absolutely fascinating things and this ended up being a very long poem and I was hoping Alice was going to read it today but um, for, for various reasons it's ended up me reading it so I, if I read it and then we can maybe talk about some of the things in it because I think there's loads of really beautiful things in, in this and it's kind of a useful starting point so the first poem was called um, Alice Through the Looking Glass and the second one is called Alice in a Bubble When you're hit by a tsunami, you can't say what water's wettest. This feels like a death, the end of something, in a bubble on my own, a chunk of life missing, like death in Venice, plagued by cholera when life is draining out. 
can't see my family. Just me and my laptop, Sophie. I'm forgetting how to socialise. Two minutes, two metres, speaking stilted. I think about people suffering, people in care homes, the young people with learning disabilities near me, whose joy is a day, to day out on buses. Nursing staff from far away, earning a pittance and dying in disproportionate numbers. Alien viruses decimating native peoples, as smallpox once did. The irony is, I've spent most of my life helping others with their mental health. I was a therapist, a psychiatric nurse. Now I'd be more hindered than help. Still, I put my face on, make for the mirror and myself. Ritual. <laughs> Choose a fancy frock, no shopping without makeup. Sunglasses over green eyeliner. What do I miss? The land round Hastings, a physical love, East Sussex in my blood, a little bit of heaven, to sit one side of the valley and look across to the farmer ploughing fields or the oast houses. Broke my heart when they ripped the orchards out. And the high wieldness of it, the ridge that goes all the way to Rye, the marshlands down to Pet, the low wieldy field, undulating, wooded, the byways and the hedgerows and the wildlife popping out. You feel that you're embraced by it. My first instinct is to hold and hug. I've not touched a human being since March the 14th. For years and years, Hastings was home, but I felt stuck. Friends said, you should be in Brighton, that's where everything is. I couldn't wait to get away, but it broke my heart to leave. I moved to Brighton, be right on Brighton, <laughs> for the Brighton Festival and the Great Escape. No Great Escape, just stuck at home again. Still, lockdown helped me know my neighbours in our little cul-de-sac. Absolutely lovely, every single one, waving as if they know you, clapping, smiling, getting on with things. What we need is a street party. I wish we'd done VE Day. My older sister remembers it. Alice is very keen to say that she was not alive during the day. <laughs> <laughs> a party for the whole estate. Dirt streets of little pebble dash cottages. Frugal, but friendly. The estate had this identity, community, all in the same boat. On VE day, a big bonfire. My sister was sent for mum's potatoes, onions too. And the onion cooked in the bonfire was the most beautiful thing she'd ever tasted. Life will never be the same. After World War II, a big street party, an end to austerity, the NHS born, universal education. And when was the Festival of Britain? We don't need all these cars, all this stuff, this conspicuous consumption. We used to have the wisdom that community mattered more than money, mattered more than the individual. I love that, community. They still have that in Wales, where my daughter lives. A famous rugby player lives in a little terrace. Charlotte Church pops into the pub on quiz night. I miss wandering through the woods. I miss my big Hastings garden, foxes, badgers, shrews, nothing in my tiny Brighton garden, just bare ground and an overgrown ivy knocking down the walls. But I will have my cottage garden, wildflowers and a pond with newts and sticklebacks and frogs, but no coy bloody carp. <laughs> <laughs> the earliest thing I remember was running through the meadows. I was maybe three and the meadow was suddenly full of water, deeper and deeper and deeper. I was deep in the water till they pulled me out. I thought it was a dream, but my brother said I'd run through the hayfield, through the wild flowers, straight into the newt pond. And though I was drowning, I shouted when they dragged me out. I was always nearly drowning or trying to swim in stagnant little ponds. The bigger kids swam in the gravel pits, picnicked in the hollow, canoodled on the ridge, and I toddled onto the drive diving board they'd rigged, and I slid off. I remember seeing the world slip away, me sinking down and bobbing up, the board too slippy for my little hands to grip, down, up, down, up, down, and through the water, down, I saw someone run over the hill to pull me out. Was I drowning or learning to swim? So 
so that was it that was it that was an attempt to be do a much more verbatim sort of poem that was really alice's words and as you can see alice and alice, alice talked about many many things <laughs> didn't you alice in that interview is there um, stuff I, forgot? I didn't know i said stuff like that i didn't know i said it. almost all of those are your are your own <laughs> words. i know they are that's that stuff and I didn't know whether it was my brother or his mate that pulled me out. But. Yeah, I think what was beautiful about that is it touched on so, around, it touched on so many things that people have experienced during lockdown: the sense of isolation, but also the sense of community and kind of new community in your neighbourhood, and you talking about those little things. I love that thing about the um, onion in the bonfire being the most delicious thing, and I think yeah. under lockdown people have learned to really appreciate very simple things like yeah. That. Well, my, of course, my sister had been just really young through the war. She was still young then, really young. And then, and they, I suppose they hadn't had onions very much, only the ones that were grown in the garden. I mean, onions were quite hard to get hold of, I gather. And um, I think she thought she was going to get into trouble for bringing them to the bonfire. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, you know, they were making sort of, they were making fun out of, just people just bringing stuff and chucking it in a bonfire to cheer them up, cheer themselves up. And it was a whole estate, a whole, you know, I, you know, like, I, I can only imagine it. I know what they were like in this thing. Well, I think you suggested that there might be a big street party in your cul-de-sac when uh, the lockdown is properly over. I think there might be. I think the whole of Hanover might have a party. It's, it's, um, <laughs> Um, I know, is there anything you want you want to i'm going to move on to the next section now but is there anything you would like to say alice you, you've got a vast sort of experience in working as a, a psychiatric nurse and a therapist and now as a as a poet and a performer is there anything that you feel you'd like to share with people um well, well just that really that everyone's including me has been really down in all sorts of ways and it's in some sometimes very scary scary ways and i there's a bit of me that worries really what's going to happen in the aftermath of all this but one thing that people have and they hope for and i'm determined that we ought to, ought to all continue to fight for is that we can't have that old world after the second world war it's interesting you did that after the second world war people shouldn't thought none of that again you know, they didn't. They didn't want anything that would give rise to Hitler and yeah. all that that stuff. They they wanted their share of, of of humanity, and I think we've just got to make sure that we enforce that. We make we just make it happen. We have a you know, we do have a greener, cleaner, less selfish, more nurturing human sort of world. Well, Otherwise, that. we'll be hopping between one calamity after another, and each time we'll all lose lose a bit more of our dignity. So, thank you, Alice. Hold on, hold on for a better world, everyone. I think. Hold on for a better world, indeed. Thank you so much for coming on and for sharing your initial experience and uh, for doing the second interview and being here as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know if anyone can see me at all. <laughs> well, I can see you. I can only see me at the moment, which is weird. I like talking to myself. The, um, I'm going to go back to reading some of the um, poems that I, I, I wrote before. And I know that kind of the issue of uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers arriving has been a very kind of divisive thing in um, Hastings and I two of the people I interviewed um, had come from other countries and it, these poems sort of explain why it is that they did have to leave their country and I think that's kind of really quite powerful to hear so the first one is called um, the disappearing headmaster and this is about somebody who came from uh, Honduras Honduras in Central America is a country I've visited it's got one of the highest homicide rates in the world, one of the highest um, murder rates in the world. Um, the regime suffers, uh, the, the, the governance of the country really suffers because of uh, the drugs trade, because of gangs, because of corruption. And this is about somebody who really was trying to make a change in that society, um, but to his own cost. So this is called 
the disappearing headmaster. And this person is a, an asylum seeker, so he's still waiting to hear um, uh, whether he will be granted uh, refugee status in this country, which is one of the reasons why he doesn't want his name used or to come on the programme. So the disappearing headmaster. I come from a land where corruption is king, where killing is casual, where hunger is usual, where dead people vote, where being a female is always a danger, a land rich in murderers and millionaires. I trained in survival skills. I trained as a paramedic, never dreamed I'd need to save my own life. I was a headmaster and a scout leader. I sought hope and trust in children's eyes. We built rafts from rubbish and ancient temples from papier-mâché, but I wanted to help build a better world. So we built a new political party. I saw hope and trust in people's eyes. We galvanised change, we mobilised youth. But change is a dangerous thing. We were infiltrated. They shot my friend in the legs, then cut his throat. I knew I'd be next. Had to get away, promised my family a holiday to England. I saw hope and trust in my daughter's eyes, made it sound the trip of a lifetime. They didn't know I was clutching a lifeline in this, a one-way ticket. We left without explanation. Family home abandoned, school suddenly headmasterless, and immigration, a tunnel to the unknown. I, I know I'm lucky to be alive, but life is in limbo. I can't work, I can't put down roots. They could send me back at any moment and that would be a death sentence for me. But I don't stop dancing, don't stop trusting, don't stop hoping. We can build a world where my daughters can dance with their dreams without danger. So, um, and this person, I, I spoke to uh, this person um, yesterday and he said he'd actually found, um, he's not able to be with his family at the moment. So he said it's the first time really he's been on his own in, in his life, um, but that actually given the enormity of what he'd already had to deal with, and that enormous upheaval of leaving with your family to come and live in a completely different country and the, you know, the severity of kind of having a death threat held over you, that actually he was not being kind of um, hugely depressed by the, the, um, the lockdown because he had really kind of built up resilience to kind of changing situations. So that was one story from um, an asylum seeker. The next one is from a Kurdish man who has got refugee status. He's been living here for many years and runs a shop um, in the America Grand area, which is the area we've been looking at. And he's, he's from Turkey, but from the Kurdish community. And this poem is called The Honey Hunger Striker. I was born in a mountain valley by the sweet, sweet waters of the Munzur River. I was born a beekeeper's son, every day a honeycomb breakfast. When I was five and gathering herbs, I disturbed a hive. Hundreds stung me, I was lucky to survive. But being bee stung makes you stronger and Kurdish honey makes you live longer. When I was 12, I was sent with a tent to work the hives on the mountainside, bee stung daily. But being bee stung makes you stronger and Kurdish honey makes you live longer. When I was 18, I read newspapers full of fire. That was enough to get me jailed. I wasn't even that political then, but I met my uncle in a cell and I joined the protest hunger strikes. When I was a student, my hunger grew for change and justice for the Kurdish people. I was jailed again. To steal our souls, they moved us into solitary cells and the torture was brutal. When you're younger, you think you can save the world. You think you're stronger, this time a longer hunger strike only drinking salt and sugar water. We call it a death fast, 
the best we could give to the fight was our bodies. If we wanted to win, some of us had to die, or so we thought. That's how we fought the state, inside and outside of prison. Hundreds fasted. Many died. My death fast lasted 150 days. Your brain shrinks, your thoughts circle, you lose your balance, you lose your memory, you lose yourself, but not your belief. And being bee stung makes you stronger and Kurdish honey makes you live longer. I got sepsis. When they took me from jail to hospital, I felt I'd failed, sold my soul, betrayed the cause by accepting treatment. But wheeled out on the stretcher, the shortest moment in honey gold sun, all leaves, all trees, I heard voices of birds. And I knew why I didn't have to die. I had life to live, to live. I escaped, trafficked through Bulgaria, walked to Greece, ferry boat to Italy, train to France and England, where I got political asylum. Became a British citizen, ran a little shop, selling newspapers and sticky sweets and happy shopper honey. And while the years passed, I forgot my trial back in Turkey, still running all these years later. One day, some men came into my shop, undercover police still hunting me all these years later. Arrested, tagged for six months, but cleared. I'm a political refugee. I'm only a criminal in Turkey. Who would know in my little shop that I was born a beekeeper's son in a mountain valley by the Munzor River? And I spoke to this person um, yesterday as well. He, um, because of his wife's um, health condition, he was thinking of closing down his shop due, during um, lockdown. And then they found a way to sort of make it uh, safe for him with the help of other people. Because also they <laughs> realised how many people were reliant on the, the, the shop for food and how many kind of elderly people um, really valued that shop. They've been doing home deliveries as well. And they've rigged up a safety screen uh, with cling film so that they can serve people through that. And um, something he said yesterday, I think really put things into perspective for me as well. I know it's been really difficult for people not to see their friends and not to see their family. Um, and I asked him how long it had been since he'd seen his family. And he said he hadn't seen his mother for six years. Um, he is not able to go back to Turkey until 2032 when the kind of um, sort of being under arrest thing is, is over. Um, so, and his family sometimes go back to, to Turkey to visit, but he's not able to go with them. But his mother sends hen honey, this big sort of vat of honey every year. And the bees are bees that feed on a mountain, wild mountain thyme. So there's a particular taste um, in that honey, which is the taste of, of home, which is kind of really precious to him. But he hasn't seen his mother for six years and he hasn't seen uh, many of his friends who were back in Turkey for uh, 19 years. So in some ways that obviously puts things into perspective of, of how kind of difficult it is for some people who've had to flee their own country. So I'm gonna do a little poem about bees. While we're on the theme of bees, I interviewed someone, um, Catherine Slater, who runs Bee Potion, which is an organic, um, um, she, she, she works with bees organically and she also runs workshops uh, encouraging people to, to learn from bees and the ways that bees um, work together to achieve things and to create the sweetness. So this is called um, The Bee Landlady. In early evenings honeyed light, here amidst the tangled oaks, I smoke the bees with the lavender they love. I hum to the hives to honour their being. I harmonise with the mesmerising rise and fall of bee buzz music. I brush the hives so tenderly, nothing rushed, each moment, each movement mindful. I watch bees gently sip on drops of gold. 
in the heart of the buzzing brood box, they busy round their queen, who breeds and leads the bees through mother love. I do not clip her wings or paint her, and I hardly harvest honey. I am simply a landlady, trading a well-swept home for a little liquid gold. I've always had a yearning for learning. I bring people to the woods to be with bees, teenagers and refugees and tiny children young as three. Bees can put the softest smile on the toughest teenager's face. Bees teach life and death, the sweet and the sting, the awe and the fear, the beingness of being here in the moment. Bees teach timelessness. They live for six weeks and for 100 million years. Such purpose in their short-lived lives. Such energy in the thriving hives. Bees teach believing. Bees teach belonging. And when the buzzy, when the busy buzzing calms, the silence still hums with the bliss and the blessing of bees. Okay, so I think we've all had some kind of beautiful nature experiences, really enjoyed nature and really uh, enjoyed nature being able to kind of breathe a sigh of, of relief since we haven't been so um, hard on it recently during lockdown. I'm gonna go now to um, my second guest, which is, who is Robbie Stedman. And so if we can maybe bring Robbie in. That would be great. Hello, Robbie. You're in your special rainbow lockdown outfit. <laughs> Brilliant. Hello there. Hello, Rosanna. Nice to see you, Robbie. Nice so Robbie, you. Robbie and I met in, uh, through a project uh, with Simon Magnus and the company, this company, uh, Root Experience. And we were, exp uh, we, were, we were working on different kind of art projects to do with hidden conditions. And it led to an exhibition in the Brighton Dome and also to this graf graphic novel, Hidden Stories, which uh, Robbie is holding up right now. And, uh, oh, there we go. There's some images inside the graphic novel. And Robbie, um, has Robbie is a creative in a million different ways and one of his dressing up alter egos is called Technicolor Dream Boy and so Robbie if you would like to introduce yourself and um, read Technicolor Dream Boy poem that would be brilliant. Hi everyone I'm Robbie Steadman I'm based in Eastbourne and I'm very creative I'm a writer I do colourful outfits and various other things that are on my bow <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm going to read this lovely poem that Rosanna wrote and entitled Technicolor Dream Boy. I wasn't always Technicolor. I worked in a factory, made boring boots in deadly shades, a shy boy, a quiet standing by boy. It started with a party. I had a drink. I didn't know what was in it. Two days later, I woke up naked, limbs locked, mind blocked, no memory of what was done to me. I hope I never remember. God, I hope I never remember. I don't know how I got there, but the darkness came with me. A year of fear, life in negativity. They'd made me HIV positive. I decided to hide and inside my cocoon, the old me was dissolving. But slowly, a new self was forming. Technicolor dream boy, new to push through to the light again. Shimmer in sequence, rippling with rainbow, unfolding his clip-on butterfly wings and taking first flight in a burst of crazy color. Now I dress to express myself. I color myself in, parade made up in every shade, a splash of green, a flash of glitter, a rainbow warrior, bold as the gold of my boots, bright as my light of cape. I strut myself at pride in bell bottoms so wide, <laughs> camp in them, 
my platform heels make me feel six feet high. I've been seen in magazines, on screens with drag queens. I'm on the scene now, big time. If Technicolor Dream Boy can bring one person any joy, if glitter can bring a glimmer of hope, if my luminescent wings can lift you up as they did me, it's worth it. I was glittered from head to toe when a man came up to me and said, you know, you brightened up my day. I was ready to go to Beachy Head, but you changed my mind. Oh, brilliant. And Thank you, Robbie. And Robbie has got some wonderful photos here of him being technical a dream, uh, technical a dream boy. I'm also now going to... Um, don't go to social close-ups of uh, Robbie has got so many amazing photos of himself in costume and um I, and they're very inspiring you know it's 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 I find it very inspiring that from kind of difficult times you've you've made something so creative out of your general life I um, need I needed something to cheer myself up and I wanted to cheer this cruel world up to be honest just to bring colour, just to bright, make uh, people's lives a little bit. Absolutely. You know, there's Absolutely. more out there. Sorry, I'm getting slightly distracted because I'm trying to bring up these images. Um, I have got the ones close. Um, no, I, if, you, if you want to hold anything else up while I'm fiddling with this, that's great. But I am... Um... <laughs> Here we go. Can you see those images? There's a fantastic one of you, I think, is this one at one of the Pride festivals with the amazing rainbow butterfly wings spread? This one was at Brighton Pride last year when I was volunteering for Lunch Positive. Brilliant, fantastic. And then we're going to whiz through a few more of these amazing rainbow. I love that one, it looks like it's grown out of your head. That, that was, that was uh, trick photography and that was just a try out of a costume, just a day out, just to yeah. try it. And there's one in Hastings. I first saw you as Technical a Dream Boy in, in Hastings. You've done a few things in Hastings. Yeah, I have. That was the very first Hastings Pride in 2016. And you were Technical a Dream Boy at a, some, a kind of mental well-being event, weren't you, in Hastings? I seem to remember in the America Ground. Yes, I was. That was my Halloween. That was my Halloween one last year. Technical a rainbow zombie there. <laughs> <laughs> this one you're looking slightly scary. And uh, there's a, an array of your foot, rainbow footwear here, which is pretty impressive. And, uh, <laughs> the, best, the best shoe rack, although um, I've seen Alice's shoe rack as well, and that's also pretty impressive. And um, I, we didn't mention this yesterday, but I wanted to show this image because I thought it was so lovely, it, the way that you've sort of curated your own objects. It's like a little altar to the things that you, yes. you like. Just, just tell me a little bit about what you, what, what you do with your stuff to make it look like that. You're in a zombie film there, I think, aren't you? No, that was when I did the zombie walk. I was a zombie walking, that right. Last, that was last year. I was a, a, a zombie pilot, but I was, I was a skinned zombie. <laughs> Brilliant, and brilliant. But I just put all of it all together on there and just, you know. It's very joyful. It's very joyful. And I think some of the things that you do, Robbie, that are really inspiring is are, are things that we could all do. I have a little altar by my bedside table where I sometimes put nature objects or family yeah. objects or season objects. And um, But you, you seem to sort of make something artistic out of everything in your life, which is really <laughs> lovely. We're going to look at some of your scrapbook entries now so did you just want to tell us a little bit about your if you've got your scrapbooks there you could hold them up as well because um i think that's one of the other things that i've seen robbie's scrap scrapbooks and they are very impressive uh, when did you start again it's a thing that you know everybody could do it sort of makes me want to kind of beautiful beautiful i'm going to sort of unscreen share as well so that we can see them a bit um closer up so do you want to hold up the, the one of the images again that's one of Fantastic. the main things i love so i, I just love that's it you've got these, these me, uh, this, one here, yeah. these this one here um this one here is midair me and midair at eastbourne pier i love it it's brilliant so uh, i need to share screen again or oh, have you got another image there 
Ah, oh, the golden ones, beautiful. I love those. I'm going to put some more, some more photographs of you. Worthing Pride. That's Worthing Pride. That was steampunk last year, both last year. Fantastic. I'm going to put some of those um, other um, images up close again. Um, because one of the other things about Robbie is Robbie is so kind of visual that um, other, other photographers have um, wanted to take photos of him. And so if I show you again. Um, so um, oh, for some reason it's not. Like, ah, there we go. So Bob Mazza, quite a, 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 a very well known um, photographer. Uh, yes. photographer. I met Bob in July that year. And I, he just oh. approached me and I was on the, on the pier doing photos of myself and he kind of did some for me and I was just surprised when I got an email to say he was putting me in the exhibition. Well you were not only in the exhibition you appear to be the poster boy for for the exhibition <laughs> so, uh, which is brilliant. So um, I'm just going to show this, these ones as well. These ones I love. And, and this was through the project that we did about hid, hidden um, conditions. And that hidden one wasn't used. That um, wasn't so used. So that one that wasn't used. But this is a photographer called Sarah Hickson. And this image I absolutely love. Tell us a little tiny bit about taking this, the, the joy of this image. And that is actually me in midair. You wouldn't think so. You would think how my foot was leaning against the... Uh, the back pole. But oh, that, I've never even seen it like that. I just saw it as a kind of there's a, there's a little little pole. Pole. If you look closely, you'll see where, where my leg is going and there's a pole. You can just see the bottom of the metal the metal uh, pole behind. You'd think I was kind of leaning against it, but I'm not. I'm actually in midair. It's a fantastic jumping shot. I love it. It took a couple of times oh. to get that right. <laughs> did it so Robbie also takes a lot of photographs himself and I think these are a sort of wonderful in, insight into the kind of the way you see the world in kind of this very multicolored way where, where where did you take I've just put these couple of photos up but where, where were they where did you take those photos uh they were when I did my backpacking trip in 2013 if I remember rightly that one with uh the church thing I think that was Oslo. Yeah, I remember you say you went you went north, didn't you? Uh, and then so this, this is my favourite photo that Robbie took, which I think is awesome, of the moon. Um, it's amazing when you have a camera that has like uh, forty optical zoom or or fifty optical zoom. You can zoom right in onto the moon at a certain lens. And then you enhance, you edit and crop it down a little bit to make the photograph bigger. And then you colour it, which I gave it a little kind of a brown haze. So it gives it a oh, bit of... Beautiful. Now, I remember that you told me that, at, like, I was hoping that you might have taken loads of uh, uh, amazing photos during lockdown. But you, I know you told me that there wasn't a lot of interest through your window. So instead, can you tell us what you have been doing <laughs> during lockdown? Yes, I've been doing a lot of um, colouring in um, just to give Facebook uh, colour. And I've kind of took these and enhanced the colour on them so they make them stand out brighter. Yeah, I love them. And Robbie's Facebook page is full with uh, full of these sort of uh, colourings in. And it's a very soothing thing to do, um, colouring in if you're feeling stressed. And I love the way you kind of put really unusual colours into the pictures, ones that we don't expect to be there. I kind of do, I kind of colour things in Robbie, in my mind's way. So the grass there is yellow. I, I don't like always uh, green all the time. I like a little bit yellow. Mixing it up a bit. No, I like it. It's great. Yeah. Just to make just to make it out as if oh this is Robbie's world. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. And um, Robbie's world also involves uh, a lot of. It's involved a lot, of, like as for a lot of people, a lot of baking. Isn't that right? Yes, because those were quiches that are now in the freezer, which I made a couple of days ago. <laughs> and and I think I, I saw this on Facebook. It was about nine o'clock in the morning, and Robbie had already made like twenty seven quiches, and I was just like, oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's Absolutely. like there's a sort of non stop creative motor going for you and generating amazing things. Done custard tarts and I've also done jam tarts as well. Great. And what was this like? Ah, so tell us a little bit about this image. That. <sighs> That is uh, something I wrote for a well-being music video, which is on YouTube called Where Do We Belong? And it's true, sometimes the people around you won't understand your journey that you're going through with your mental health, but they don't need to. It's not for them. They shouldn't, yeah. they shouldn't <laughs> even ask questions. And it was a video, wasn't it, made especially for lockdown with people all around the world uh, holding up quotes that were same, sometimes by famous people, but sometimes by themselves. Yours is by yeah. your own quotes. And people are holding up their, the flag of their country and a message yeah. to get you through lockdown. And, um, and I, I found it quite moving. I had a little cry, actually, the, the, where the guy says, hold on, and then he reaches his, his hand out towards the screen. I found that really moving but actually all of the messages that are in there are, are relevant beyond lockdown as well aren't they they're not you know they're things that could help you through any kind of difficult mental health um yes that's that's true but it was amazing i got i got a copy of the the music video and i've shared it on my facebook so people can actually click on the link to have a look and it's on my star now profile as well um but yeah i've got a couple of friends that were in that video Wonderful. Uh, I know yeah. you, 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 you've been to quite a lot of events where you're kind of supporting mental well-being with your creativity. And I just want to end, Robbie, on that quote that you um, have shared with us before. Well, the quote that I've got is, keep being creative and always never stop following your dreams. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Robbie. Thanks for the initial share of the, your, your story as well and for coming on no, today. It was a pleasure and thank you for what you wrote. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. OK, um, we're coming towards the end now. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read two last poems. Um, one of them is... Um, one of them is linked actually to hidden illnesses. Um, it was written after an interview with Roxanne Roma, who um, lives in a van in, in the area of um, St. Leonard's, where there are lots of people, uh, homeless people camping in vans up till recently, obviously under lockdown, people have been housed. Uh, it's interesting that it's taken that for people to be housed, but Roxanne unfortunately can't, be, can't live in a house because she has um, multiple ke chemical sensitivity and electrosensitivity. So she is affected by Wi-Fi and all sorts of different materials. So this is the poem that I wrote for her. Um, it's called The Microwaved Woman. It was never my plan to live in a van, but a building for me cannot now be home. In a zone with Wi-Fi, my symptoms soar sky high. I'm a universal reactor. Almost anything can be a factor in making me sick. Everything prickles, tickles, torments, chemicals are crippling. And I feel electromagnetic waves rippling through my brain. I can sense your mobile phone. I can feel the invisible. And the whirling world so busy it makes me dizzy with its constant communications. So many things call palpitate, cause palpitations or nosebleeds. Smart meters stupefy me, and the lynx effect has a jinx on me. My throat restricts, I fall in fits and lose myself, bruise myself all over, or my skin burns and turns red till I look cooked by this microwaved world. In the madness of modernity, everything is felt by me with my spider sensitivity, as if every thread of the world wide web were tugging. They call us the canaries in the coal mine, warning that our world is turning toxic. Like the princess and the pea, everything is so felt by me. If only the world were made of glass. And it's not just chemical or electrical. I was an aromatherapist, used to love the smell of honeysuckle, now perfumes and pollens 
make me buckle. The scent of jasmine and orange, no longer sweet. So tired of feeling so wired to the world, I moved to a seaside car park, a quiet place washed by wind and wave. My van is my bubble, the southwest wind my oxygen. Strangers have been angels, bringing me food when I couldn't walk, speaking for me when I couldn't talk. And the friend who has been my voice to the outside lives on a seaside bench himself, a comrade in homelessness. The sea breeze frees me, brings some ease. My seizures here are not so strong. I start to belong to myself again, but they may move me on, please. Let me have some peace. Um, so Roxanne is someone who is experiencing a lot of the things that a lot of us have felt under lockdown, being in a bubble, not being able to get her own food, not being able to move around for years. And, and, and so that has been, I think, extremely hard for her. Um, I'm going to share one last poem, which is called The Hunger Brothers. And this is uh, about Pete and James Robinson, who runs Surviving the Streets, who, um, have done, who do an amazing job um, delivering food, both to the homeless and also to people who are um, uh, struggling to, uh, to, to, to have enough money for food, families uh, who are struggling, people who are struggling. And they've been doing amazing work before lockdown, but obviously their work has got, become a lot busier. Um, with lockdown and the, the food delivery work they're doing now so if you check out the website of surviving the streets you can see what kind of work they're doing so um this poem is called the hunger brothers we know hunger we know what it feels like as kids to find the fridge empty except for alcohol we know what it's like to grow up on the streets where mum and dad were drinking we know how tough it is to sleep rough we've lived that a little too I sorted myself, running a cleaning company and programming computers, worked hard, too hard, till I crashed, a breakdown, shaking for three months in my bed. But I started to feel the world differently, see all the pain and the poverty instead of the pound signs, as if I'd been blind before, and now I could see my reason to be here, I could find my strength. We know hunger me and my brother. So we take food to children's and adult centres, and most nights a week, we're out on the streets with the homeless, serving good food that shops would throw away to people who too often get turned away. Hot meals, warm clothes, for those who get left out in the cold. Sure, some of them are using, but you need to know their story. My brother knows addiction, but he got through. Living proof they can do it too. I'm so proud of my brother. Sometimes, months later, someone comes in a suit. So smart, we hardly recognise them. But they'll cuddle us both so hard and say, you know, you saved my life. There are abandoned playgrounds here. We want to make them community gardens. Change cracked concrete to cabbages and potatoes. We want people to know all the goodness you can find in your own garden. We want to show that from broken places, beautiful things can grow. Without realising it, I'm just thinking that's a really nice message um, um, for lockdown. Um, I know lots of people have been doing gardening through lockdown and that idea of, you know, something beautiful growing out. Of something difficult has been sort of a theme of today's session so i just wanted to say that if anybody has got any stories of ordinary people who have done something a bit extraordinary with their life or are extraordinary in some way please do um, get in contact and let me know and um, my name is rosanna Lowe, and you can find me on facebook um, and um, or you could put your contact details in the Q and A be below, and I could contact you in that way. And um, also to say that there, this is the first of eight salons. Each one is with a different uh, guest, inviting um, guests in with them. Um, there are eight of them. Uh, Sunday, four to five for the next seven weeks on from now, and um, they're going to be wonderful. They're run by MSL Projects, and Isolation Station is helping us. 
and there are also I'm running three free creative writing workshops to do with these sessions so if you uh, look on MSL projects website or you just google rock on rock fair you can find details of signing up for those free creative writing workshops um, thank you so much for coming I hope it's been an entertaining hour and uh, thank you again to, to all the guests <laughs> for sharing their very inspiring and moving stories so thank you very much come to